What's going on, everybody, and welcome to the morning recording. It's actually not morning at all. It's 1230 <laughs> here on the uh, Pacific, here on the West Coast. Um, had some unexpected errands and things to run this morning. Um, and uh, not here with you guys until 1230 this afternoon, so I do apologize for not being here in the morning to hang out with you guys for a little while. Um, having my second cup of coffee just so I could have it with you guys here. Um, smoking a bowl. And um, wanted to tell you guys a little bit about my weekend. Um, so on Friday, we went to Salem like I talked about. Um, drove around in Salem. Uh, Nikki showed me all the cool spots. She used to live there, so she showed me all the cool spots up there. Um, went and saw the Capitol building. Has a gold statue on top. And went and hung out and walked all around. And uh, it was very beautiful up there. Um, she went to the mall and we went shopping and she went and got some makeup bullshit and, and all that. And I went and found some other stores to look at and hang out at while she was in there doing makeup shopping. And then when she was done with that, we went and, and grabbed some lunch, uh, got some lunch at a place called the best little roadhouse, um, <clears throat> little, um, you know, burger, uh, steak joint. Um, I actually had a smoked tri-tip sandwich. It was excellent. They um, they were efficient. Uh, the waitresses were very. Uh, our waitress was very courteous. Uh, made conversation. Uh, was very fast on the ball. Um, she got a good tip because because of all that. And the food was excellent itself. Um, my tri tip sandwich was medium rare. Um, just how I like it. A little red in the middle still. Um, Seemed like they had their own barbecue sauce. You came with a side of barbecue sauce. I put all over that sandwich. And uh, Nikki, she uh, she got like a um, barbecue style hamburger. Um, she likes those style hamburgers. Some places call them like a Johnny Cash burger or like a Western burger, stuff like that. You know, the onion rings and uh, barbecue sauce and cheese and the burger and all that. So uh, we thought it was excellent. Um, yeah, we had a good time. And so after that, we went and saw our mom and me and her mom had a political debate <laughs> over the state of our country right now. I don't even want to get into all that right now, but um, I love her, and uh, people have to agree to disagree, I guess, sometimes. But I try to get through the people, tell them just not to be so scared in the world, because um, uh, I think uh, that the world, all the bad shit that's been happening in the world was happening before last Tuesday, and uh, it's going to keep happening. Um you know, there's always going to be bad things and good things that happen in the world. Um, that's the duality that we all live by while we're here in this existence, unfortunately. Um, so, anyways, uh, so we, uh, yeah, so we went up there, and on the way back, like I said, we stopped uh, in Saruman. That was in Eugene. And so uh, it was a long, nice day, a cool road trip. Got to spend a, a lot of time in the car together having good conversation and seeing a lot of cool sights um <clears throat> so i hope you guys all had a wonderful weekend um hopefully none of you guys got too drunk and and uh didn't end up on any world star videos or anything like that so um oh yeah and then so <laughs> my weekend it wasn't was not just friday obviously saturday was ufc 205 um in the first ufc card uh in new york at Madison Square Garden, the most famous arena in the world, uh, they packed that place to the rafters with people. Um, they broke the gate as far as um, money earned on uh, ticket sales. They're for uh, people who attended. <clears throat> so it was very successful. The pay-per-view numbers are supposed to uh, be very positive as well. So um, great night for the UFC. That's for damn sure. And uh, I could not believe that Conor McGregor – I mean, I know I – I didn't call the round. I called the first round as a knockout for Connor, but you know I still couldn't believe when he did it. When he not when he was just dominating Eddie Alvarez from start to finish, and Eddie didn't press him, um, you know, like he did Anthony Pettis, and he didn't get him to the cage enough to be able to work him against the cage. And <clears throat> I just could not believe how sharp Connor McGregor looked, with how distracted he looked throughout the week and all that. He just that's who he is, man, and he comes to fight. When it's time to fight, he comes to fight, and he's done the work, and um, he reaped the rewards for that work. So he's uh, now the first, the UFC's first two-division champion. Um, there's been other fighters who have held 
um, titles at multiple weight classes, but not at the same time. Uh, I believe BJ Penn attempted the feat, but was defeated by George St. Pierre when he tried to go up to welterweight when he was already lightweight champion. So Connor is the uh, first guy to do it. Uh, his after fight speech was awesome. <laughs> To say the least, he thought he was going to apologize because if you guys weren't paying attention, Connor had a couple of scuffles uh, backstage during fight week. Not scuffles, but just verbal scuffles. But he uh, definitely had some verbal alter altercations with some of the other fighters on the card during fight week. And um, we thought he was going to apologize for those verbal altercations. He started to say... Because he has great delivery. He started to say, I want to apologize to... Uh, and then he said, to none of you motherfuckers, basically. So, <laughs> it was absolutely hilarious. He uh, he stayed true to the form of his character. And um, he didn't move a bit. You know, when Eddie asked him to apologize for things he said lead in, in, leading up to the fight, he uh, he didn't budge. And uh, he didn't budge here either. So, And it sets up... Not budging sets up greater numbers and uh greater height for fights in the future you know so if he ever ends up because the two guys that he had uh verbal altercations with were tyron woodley who's the current welterweight champion and see this is where connor's smart see uh these weren't just random so the first one was tyron woodley um they exchanged some words i guess after the the real uh weigh-in the day before the fights on friday and um he also exchanged words with habib uh Nurmagomedov, who won his fight um, pretty dominantly. And so they had a verbal altercation, Khabib, I'm sorry, Habib and Connor did. And Habib, um, who had a long layoff in between fights, um, is the guy that a lot of people think should have been getting a title fight over Connor versus Eddie in the first place. He's the guy that a lot of people think he's the unheralded, lightweight, number one contender for a long time. He was injured for a long time. Um, so both of these guys are relevant in Connor's future, and I have to think that Connor's intelligent enough to have spurred both of these arguments on in order to set up possible confrontations in the future. So uh, Habib is the number one lightweight contender. Tyron Woodley's the welterweight champion. Connor, Connor has uh, talked a lot of shit saying that he'd like to go up and, and get a third belt. He says all the belts, whatever. Um, that basically means... The farthest he could go up is welterweight, and even that's a little bit of a stretch. Um, you can tell a lot of people are weary of Connor going against someone like Tyron Woodley. Uh, you know, Connor's very talented. He's done things that nobody else has done in the sport, but to go against someone who's just naturally so much bigger and stronger with that kind of knockout power and that sort of wrestling base. See, Tyron Woodley. He, more than anybody else Connor's face, has the ability to take the fight where he wants it. Um, you know, with his wrestling, he can keep it standing. Or, you know, I have to think that even though Connor's takedown defense is looking better and better and better, and that each wrestling guy they put in front of Connor doesn't get the job done, it's a big task going up to 170 and facing someone with a wrestling pedigree like Woodley. And um, I would have to think that that would be pretty scary for Connor to do that, but he's a ballsy son of a bitch and you never know what he's going to do. So, uh, both Habib and Tyron Woodley, both are relevant, um, as far as possible opponents for Connor's future. So those altercations probably were planned on his side. He's a smart man. Um, him basically rubbing it in their face again, post fight speech in general, you know, it keeps that, momentum going towards possible fights with them in the future so um the card was great uh misha tate retired makes me sad she's my favorite female fighter of all time i've been watching her for a long time misha take down tate now misha cupcake tate uh it was sad to see her lose against amanda nunez a couple of few months ago after just finally winning the title um, and it was sad to see her lose, even though, you know, the fight was a, a good fight, but you can definitely tell Misha to me feels like, um, you know, like on the, on the men's side, you have guys who help build the game into what it is today, like old school fighters who had to pass the torch on to a newer generation fighters, uh, fighters. That's what Misha seems like to me, you know, like a couple of years ago, 
her stand up game didn't seem like it was behind like or lacking to me. Like she's of course a wrestling based uh fighter first and her striking game is always what is needed more work, but more today than any time um that I've seen her fight or, you know, these last couple of fights, her striking game has looked you know, like it's last generation, you know, like it's archaic compared to the dynamic striking that a lot of these girls are presenting today. So um, I would say that the straw weight women's division has the most advanced striking as far as um, women technical striking ability goes. Uh, but the bantamweight division is quickly catching up and those girls have a little bit more uh, pop behind their strikes. And a girl like Amanda Nunes um, really showed that the sport is growing and fighting someone like Misha Tate. And so Misha is an ambassador for the sport. She, um, you know, built a lot of the groundwork for the women to come into the UFC. Everybody gives all the credit to Ronda. That's bullshit. Ronda deserves um, a lot of the credit, but so does Misha. And so does a lot of those other girls um, that a lot of people probably aren't even like Gina Carano or, um, you know, or even like Cyborg. Um, finally, a lot of people are getting to know who Cyborg is, but it's sad that a lot of UFC fans' first exposure to who Cyborg is is um, some of the people who are supposed to be promoters of this sport and also ambassadors of this sport talking a lot of shit on her. But that's what, you know, Joe Rogan's a comedian and it's not my business to even say his name. He's so successful um, and he's done what he's done. So um, a lot of respect to him, but. You know, she deserves a lot of respect as well. So she's a fucking beast. She'll never be able to get down to 135. She's a 145 fighter. I believe she has an ability to anchor a whole women's division just like Ronda Rousey and, and Misha had the ability to do at bantamweight um, to build a division around those girls. I believe um, Cyborg has an – you can build a division around her. You just got to find enough girls who can fight at 145. That's the problem um, is that the sport's growing, but uh, fighters need time to – become fighters, you know, uh, kids have to grow up and train and it takes time to build numbers in the amount of people who want to participate in a new and upcoming sport. So you have to give time for <clears throat> the fighters, um, abilities to saturate the mark, the market there. But, um, it's just to, if they just keep using cyborg as, <clears throat> like a circus act just with these fights where you know she's going to smash the other girl, but just just an exhibition so you can see her fight. If they just keep using her like that until she retires, that's going to kind of make me sad. She should have a division where she can be the champion and uh, get the accolades and the respect that she deserves. So I hope they do build a 145 division, a women's featherweight division around Cyborg Justino, but <clears throat> you never know if they're going to. You never know with uh, Dana White, especially in the new owners. Uh, I guess they're they've been rather standoffish. A lot of the fighters who normally have close contact, you know, or some contact with the with the owning party there, they haven't had a lot of contact with the new owners. Um, so we're gonna see what happens there. But overall, UFC 205, a great card for those of you guys. For those of you guys that watched it, um, you know, it was great for you guys that didn't watch it. Ha ha! And you should go buy that shit or find a way to see it and watch it and you should buy it that way you support the product don't just be an asshole um so okay so the reason why i was late today is because um my girlfriend nikki she's had some some health issues with her back she's had a couple of surgeries and um it's been aggravating her again and the last couple of days i think riding in the car the salem and back even though we've had some other road trips um since her last surgery, I don't know. I just think it, it maybe really got to her, uh, maybe tweak something in her back. And so the last couple of days since then, she's had no ability to be comfortable. And, um, uh, and it, sometimes it makes me upset because I just want to help her and there's nothing I can do. And sometimes I feel like my upsetness, I even like almost take it out on her in a way. And that makes me feel really bad because she's the person I want to help. And I become upset because there's nothing I can do. And um, this morning I just wanted to make her feel, I just want to make her feel better. And I just can't. And I, you know, I uh, helped drive her over to the hospital because I didn't want her driving herself because she's feeling so bad and she's having a, a hard time doing physical things. And I just 
got to thinking about why do I react so negatively sometimes when people are hurt around me or are experiencing something traumatic or negative around me? Why do I have a hard time staying calm myself? And um, because that's what the person needs. They need somebody calm around them. And I, sh and I know that because I've been in lots of these situations in my life. I've been in emergency situations and traumatic situations. And um, this morning I reacted particularly uh, poorly and um, got, I started wondering why today, um, why was I reacting even more poorly, poorly than normal? And um, got to thinking, today's November 14th. Um, and one of the people who used to have a lot of health problems in my life that I used to need to be there for a lot in my young years was my grandma. And my grandma was born on November 14th, 1930. And um, she died this time of year as well. I mean, just within a few days, give or take from now, was the day of her death. I'm not going to say the exact day, but... So, it's you know, there's a couple of times a year that maybe there's an, an underlying emotional emotionality or an underlying situation that's still part of my being that even though it happened a long time ago, maybe it still affects me in certain times of the year and um, certain times of the year hold certain types of energy. And sometimes I have to deal with that. Um, so I, you know, it's, I think that for some reason, um, it brought back some feelings like, um, of times when my grandma had problems, when she was going through her problems late in her life, uh, back when I was like 14 in the, <clears throat> In 1990, 1996, 1997, um, 13, 14 years old, um, my grandma used to, he, my dad was, <clears throat> you know, he wasn't there. He uh, was locked up a lot of the time. And uh, especially during this time when my grandma was having a lot of her health problems, my dad, we had just been raided and my dad had just been taken off to prison um, for his participation in certain things in the world <laughs> having to do with the drug trade. But uh, it's none of your guys' goddamn business. No, I'm just kidding. But, <clears throat> so, uh, my grandma, she used to have, she had a lot of health problems in her life. She was diabetic. She had high blood pressure and, um, she had a propensity, f you know, and for heart attacks or for strokes. And she had a, a few strokes <clears throat> after my, after my dad got locked up that last time after we got raided. And, um, she used to tell me. When I have a stroke, don't don't call the police or don't call your aunt Pat. My grandma has a twin sister, and she's still alive. My aunt Pat, um, it's her 86th birthday today. Happy birthday, aunt Pat. Um, but my grandma used to tell me, you know, don't call 911 and, and don't call your aunt Pat. And I had to call 911. I didn't know how to save her life myself. And, uh, you know, so <clears throat> the last time my grandma had a stroke, um, Back in, and see, she's been gone for almost 20 years now. It's 19 years that she's been gone, but she's still one, you know, favorite, one of my favorite people all time in my whole life, and uh, I'll always love her, and she's still my grandma, and she's not was, she still is, and that's just the way I, I am, but um, the last time she had a stroke, it was, it had to have been 19 mid 1990s early 1996 mid 1996 and uh i called 911 and they came and they got her and um uh, <clears throat> she went to the hospital and my cousin barbara who is my aunt pat's daughter she's a generation ahead of me she's a generation older than me but she's my cousin um she came in and picked me up and took me down to the hospital and and I uh, had a conversation with my grandma, and uh, even though she lived for a whole, about a, another 10 months from that point on, um, no, it was, it was more, it had to have been more than 10 months. I'm getting the timeline wrong somewhere, because she passed away in November of 1997. All this happened, I guess, basically a year. It must have been like, the last stroke must have been going into the, into the winter time. Of 1996, but um, <clears throat> nevertheless, when she had that last stroke, we saw her in the hospital, 
and uh, we had a conversation. And uh, my grandma was all about just in life was about the basic, like the small things, like just like the basic things that make a person happy or that a person wants to make him happy. She was born in the Great Depression, was raised in the Great Depression and during World War II. And um, they were a lot of people in that generation, the greatest generation ever. Uh, they just, you know, they, it didn't take a lot of fancy technology or hype or bullshit or plastic parts to make them happy, you know? And that's what I, that's the way my grandma was. And I remember her telling me that she just wants a cheeseburger. And uh, <clears throat> that was after her having a stroke, too. She still had the ability to speak. Um, but after that, she was taken from that hospital and she was put in a convalescent home uh, about 40 miles away or so in a, a different town, uh, Merced, California, in the Central Valley. Um, good town to some people, but a, a shitty town for a lot of people. It's a dirty-ass little town there. And um, Anyway, that's besides the point. That's also where my dad overdosed on heroin, but that's besides the point. Um, she was put in a convalescent home there. I went to live with my cousin Barbara and her two sons, who are my cousins as well, um, Zach and Jed while my grandma lived in this convalescent home and we would go visit her once a week on Saturdays. Um, and props to Barbara for, you know, taking us up there and giving me rides up there to see my grandma once a week, every Saturday. Um, I would go up there and I would spend some time with her and the co the conversation I had with her in the hospital, um, when she first had her stroke, that last stroke was the last conversation I ever had with her. She never spoke again. Um, she'd look at me, um, she wouldn't acknowledge my words and, and, um, she wouldn't speak. She could, I don't, she couldn't anymore or she wouldn't. Um, she was one of the strongest willed people, um, maybe the strongest willed person that I've ever known, probably the strongest willed person I've ever known. And I do believe that she chose not to speak that last year that, She's probably ready to go for a long time. Um, see, her, the love of her life was my grandpa, my grandpa Hugh. And he actually passed away, I think, r r like six or five or six years before I was born, like 1976, 1977, somewhere around there. And um, I guess my grandma didn't speak for a full year after he passed away. Um, that's how deeply she loved that's how strong willed she was. And that was her dedication to that, to that soul that was next to her. And she went through that. See, and I was a, such a little asshole. Cause I was confused in my childhood because my dad was fucking up in his life. And he was causing disturbances in my life. Obviously I was already, when my grandma, see, I was, I had already been put in foster care before that. When I was 11 years old, my dad overdosed on heroin. Um, and I was in foster home for almost a year before my grandma got custody of me. She fought to get custody of me. And that was probably one of the last things she did to use like a lot of strength in her life. And um, so she fought to get custody of me. And that's how I got back there. I had already been put in foster homes. So my, my dad had already helped um, cause some friction in my mind. And I was an upset young man and I didn't know why. I didn't even understand to think of why. All I knew is I was upset and and uh, the people around me, you know, were going to know it. And so I didn't listen to my grandma lick a lot of times. Like um, once I got to a certain age, like after after I was put in the foster home and got back, it's almost like I had went and been, you know, subjected to being locked up somewhere and almost like uh, it. And it changed me and like not being in the foster home specifically changed me, but just the whole ordeal in itself being pulled and plucked away from your family and thrown into a new setting. These people are calling themselves your family and you're somewhere you've never been and everything smells like foreign and, 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 uh, those are just a couple of ways you can experience being a foster home for the first time, but it's very traumatizing and there's no other ways. 
to put that being stripped away from your family and to have everything uprooted and have the uh, illusion shattered in front of your eyes and and uh, no bitch Santa Claus isn't real Mickey Mouse is a cartoon and um, this is the real world so that's what happened and I was I felt like <clears throat> I took out a lot of my emotional anxiety on my grandma and maybe that's part of the reason why she didn't speak to me the last year but you know she's a very spiritual person as well um a lot of my propensity to to question things and to look to the fringe of things to look to try to to peel the carpet back to look under the carpet of this existence comes from her and um i don't know maybe she didn't speak that last year maybe she was attempting to deepen her consciousness in some way to come and you know to already start preparing to deal with what she was going to deal with when she passed i don't know but uh i put her through a lot of shit and <coughs> my dad put her through a lot of shit and um you gotta just come to the realization that people are who they are i guess and that's what i did with my father until his last days you know um as well so uh anyways i think so I, what i'm saying is that past emotional trauma and grief that you've experienced even if you've processed it and been through it and um and even if you're 20 years down the road sometimes that can still come up in times of the year that are intertwined with the emotionally charged times of your life can um cause upheaval so just be aware of that if maybe if you don't maybe if you just if you feel emotionally upset and you don't know why or if you feel grief or something like that and you don't know why just you have to take a few minutes by yourself and think about it and process it and try to ask yourself why you're feeling that and, the, and generally the answers will come to you so just remember to take a breath today um don't take out your baggage on your loved ones especially i mean don't take it out on any of your loved ones even ones you have to you can't continue to get revenge on maybe your father your mother who put you through some traumatic issues in your childhood throughout the rest of your adult life if you're lucky enough to still have them in your life as an adult um make sure they know that, that you love them don't just be an asshole to them because they fucked up a long time ago most likely they were trying as hard as they could and all human beings are are human we're not machines and sometimes we make bad decisions and Sometimes some parents make some really fucked up decisions and if they put in you place in places where they allowed you to be hurt or they allowed other people to touch you or hurt you in ways that you shouldn't have been, then that's probably a whole different story and I have no room to be speaking about that, but um we still have to try to move on past those things. We can't live in the traumatic episodes of our past because then we're just living as victims. Especially if someone attacked you or victimized you. Um if you continue to live your life differently than you would have before the victimization, then they're still tormenting you. Um, you know, if something bad like that happened to you and you're reliving it every day, then essentially in the world, in your mind, that act is being carried out every day perpetually. And, um, and you, your mind is the universe feeling the collateral damage of that pain. So um, let's remember to love each other. Extend your hands out in love. No matter what your political differences are, no matter what your most external appearances um, are, who cares if you're two different shades of pigment? Who cares if you're a union worker and that guy's not? Who cares if you're a Democrat and he's a Republican? Um, all of those things are organizational categories used to divide us so let's remember that we're all wondrous ever expanding creatures that are meant to love and have experiences not meant to live in hateful places in our minds and uh, not meant to be perpetually attacked or victimized either so um, all of you people who have experienced traumatic things in your life i'm here for you i'm here with you i believe in you your feelings are valid um but go kick ass now 
It's time for you to kick ass. It's time for you to go get that what you want, what that goal is in your life. It's time for you to get it. You've been suffering enough. You've punished yourself enough for it. It's not your fault. It wasn't your fault what happened to you. Go get what you fucking want in life. Stop sitting on the couch and thinking about it. It's right there in front of you. It's attainable. You can do it. Trust me. You can do it. I can do it. We can do this together. Um, the world is ours. And not just this world. Beyond this world. This world is not where you began. And this world is not where you will end. If this world is where you began and it is all that you are, then that would mean that you wouldn't have been a stranger when you got here. You wouldn't have been trying to figure it out. You would have had more of an innate understanding of this environment if that's what you were if that's where you came from. You were interjected into this environment from somewhere else and your greatness um, lives here, but it exceeds this place. And just remember that um, you're going through t- uh, tests right now. You're going through trials. You're going through tribulations. Um, they're just meant to teach you some things. They're not meant to make you feel bad forever. Um, so just remember that. And just remember that what happens here stays here and it was meant to happen so that way you can learn from it and don't feel bad after you're out of this place and don't let anything on the other side make you feel like you have to come back to repay some karmic debt. Tell them to fuck off and that you're greater than all this and that you learned what you learned while you're there and you learned that love is what you needed to have in your heart Um, and you learned what you needed to from having um, hurdles in your way and from overcoming obstacles. Um, But to think that the only way you can undo harm you've done is to create more action with the possibility of creating more harm um, is a logical fallacy. So just remember that. I love you guys, and we need to love each other. And it sounds like some hippie bullshit. I know. You weren't raised like that, but it's true. Uh, we need to find more reasons to come together and less reasons to separate ourselves. And remember that 50.75% of the people telling the other 49.25 people how to live their lives isn't right either. Whatever the the true answer is for all of us to live our lives peacefully and lovingly in this life, whatever that answer is, it's the answer for all of us. It's the answer for all of us except those harming other people. Um, it's not only the answer for 50% of the people. Just remember that. And uh, remember that our four, our forefathers had the same argument. Um, so, anyways, I vowed to myself it wasn't going to get political today, but um, don't get entrapped into <clears throat> into one way of thinking or another. Keep your minds open and and keep your thinking critically <clears throat> active and uh, think from a balanced perspective. Anyways. Whew. So what I wanted to do today, um, other than just ramble at you guys, was I wanted to go ahead and, and read a creative piece of writing that I did a couple of years ago. Sometimes it, what's cool about expressing yourself um, in the written medium is that you can go back and you can read it. And it's almost like you're you're reading someone's new material over again for the first time because uh, we're all growing and we're all morphing into something different from what we were yesterday. So um, <clears throat> whenever I share these creative writing pieces with you guys, um, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to filter it. I'm just going to be honest with myself and with you guys and, and read it word for word. And however immature I sound or, you know, I'm not, to, this is supposed to be serious, but uh, you know, I'm just going to keep it real. I'm not going to filter it. Or if I read you guys from some, something from 10 years ago that I wrote, because um, there, I do have access to some things that I, I wrote that long ago. I've had a topsy turvy life, so I've had a hard time um, keeping a lot of my material that I've written, um, whether it's lyrics or stories or ways I think we can improve the world or speeches and, and things like that. There's probably multiple computers, hard drives. There's at least five or six computers out there that have a lot of my writing on them that I'll never have access to again. Um, either friends that are no longer actively friending <laughs> or 
spiteful ex-girlfriends who won't give me my written material because they know it means something to me. So, um, anyways, but I still do have <clears throat> some of what I've written and I do have access and I do have some of the things I've written from quite a long time ago. So this one is just a couple years old, not even that actually just about a year old, I do believe. But anyways, um, with no further ado, this is perspectives by Jerry Hawker. Life is all about perspective. Girl, you're not fat. You're voluptuous. No, I'm not a stalker. I just like to keep a close eye on those I have an interest in. I have this friend. A lot of people call him a thief because he likes to secure their belongings in a safe place of his own choosing. I don't think people should judge one another, so I keep a track record of people's behavior so I can defend myself in case they try. I'm not yelling at you. I'm passionately giving you constructive criticism. I'm not depressed. I enjoy sulking in the memories of my own failures. It keeps me grounded. People really shouldn't call you a slut just because you like to enjoy new experiences. I'm not high. I'm medicated. This is not an unorganized, poorly written bunch of sentence fragments. It is an enjoyable, eclectic collection of random thoughts. I'm not poor. I choose to live this way so I can appreciate what others have in their lives. I didn't fail. I'm learning how to succeed with every attempt. I'm not staring at you. I'm attempting to understand your nature. My attention span isn't narrow. However, I have the ability to change focus. Ah, my attention span isn't narrow. However, my ability to change focus is very broad. I'm not lazy. I choose to meditate on a regular basis from a comfortable spot in my home. My father didn't die. He finally found his inner peace. This is the last time I'm going to tell you. I'm not ignoring you. I'm allowing you to process information on your own accord. And that was Perspectives by Jerry Hawker. So, uh, kind of an abrupt ending. Like, reading that one back, it kind of ended it abrupt. I didn't exit very gracefully. I don't know. Um, you know, in this type of writing exercise, uh, where it's basically, you know, one-liner after one-liner. I don't know how I could have exited very gracefully, but... Gracefully, but... Gracefully. <laughs> But anyway, so I wanted to share that with you guys. Um, something I wrote a while back. Um, I don't know. I think it's pretty interesting. I think it's pretty funny. You guys let me know what you think in the comments. Um, I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. A wonderful afternoon. It's the afternoon recording, not the morning recording today. Because I was late over here. But uh, I hope that you guys all... Don't get in an argument today and that you guys all work on something that you enjoy, that you succeed today, that you work towards attaining a goal that you feel is important in your life. Um, so I uh, hope you guys have some fun today. Hope you guys uh, just do you. Channel you, your inner self. The answers are within you. They're not outside of you. There's no savior going to come save you. Um, your employer doesn't secure your standing in this life. You do. Um, you would succeed with or without that employer. You would find a way. I have faith in you, even if you don't have faith in yourself. Um, find the confidence in yourself to make the changes in your life you need to so that you can be comfortable and fuck comfortable so you can be happy and have the experiences you like to have not just the ones that other people have convinced you that you need to have um, other people even sometimes family members don't know what's best for you so remember you know what's best for yourself treat your family and uh, your neighbors and uh, the extended family the community around you well and have a wonderful day um, cutting this off a little bit short today, just 40 minutes. Um, hope you guys don't feel too sad about that. Don't worry. My sexy voice will be back for you tomorrow. Um, this has been the morning recording.